That is my presentation. Okay. Um, LAO, any comments on this? This is a rather dramatic change of direction for us. Uh, due to the state's fiscal condition, we have recommended elimination of the adult day health um, optional benefit without prejudice to the merits of the program. Um, we would note, however, that a transition plan would be needed um, to transition these folks to other services um, due to a potential conflict with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, we have also recommended that the administration come forward with a more um, appropriate savings estimate given the potential cost shifts to other services. And uh, Ms. Johnson, if you could uh, help review for us if quickly the kinds of actions we have as a legislature in recent years taken to try to contain costs, to limit costs to the program, and what became of those efforts? Okay. So there's been previous cost containment efforts. Um, they've included a mor moratorium on the program. Um, we have also um, have looked at the medical acuity criteria. Um, and then we've been working with the program to reduce the number of days that are currently provided to beneficiaries from five days to three days. We've tried many reforms, um, but most have been enjoined, and therefore we're proposing full elimination. Right. So the uh, moratorium still in place? Yes, it is. The medical acuity eligibility criteria, that was enjoined. Mm -hmm. The limit of three days, that was enjoined. That was enjoined. Right. So... Colleagues, this is where we are. We have tried to contain costs. Uh, what I can tell you, and I'm happy to hear from many colleagues as well, as important as this is to so many of us in our communities, uh, what I'm hearing mostly is about the community that ADHC has provided for our seniors, that it's a place for them to get out of their homes, many of them probably living near shut-in existences, to be able to mingle with others their age, their compatriots, uh, and yes, there is the medical provision there, but we have heard from finance that that medical provision would still be available because they are all medically, uh, Medi-Cal uh, eligible. So the recommendation here is that rather than eliminate the $176 million in funding, that we would take a savings of $151 million, preserving $25 million, which maybe a life support description of where we're going, but also that the great cost that we would be saving would be the medical part of it, still available through other Medi-Cal providers, sustaining the meeting place, sustaining the social aspects of the program. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Huff and then Senator DeSaulnier. I was wondering if the LEO could explain how that would work. It was kind of our understanding. It was an all or nothing thing. We couldn't be parsing pieces of it because we'd just end up in some pretty murky waters. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> like throwing you right in front Meredith of Meredith Worden with the Legislative <laughs> Analyst Office. I'm, I'm not clear at this point how such a reduction could be operationalized. Um, as we have stated before, without prejudice to the merits of the program, we have recommended um, adoption of the governor's proposal given the state's fiscal situation. We have also noted that a transition plan would be required to move these uh, beneficiaries to other Medi-Cal services where appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Senator Huff, I might suggest that the answer to your question, which is a, a very reasonable question, would be a $25 million block grant to social services. And then the only other modifier I can share with you all is that we did nearly sustain in its entirety, I think, uh, just trimming $5 million as opposed to the governor's elimination of the multi-purpose senior service program that we have sustained with $15 million, and that, of course, being the case management program for seniors who are, yes, seeing a lot of what they currently have provided to them cut back, but still have that person in their life who can dig deep to see what kind of county programs, any other kind of federal programs, just someone to hold their hand and help them find some replacement services where possible. Senator Saulnier and then uh, Senator Alquist. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to bring up what you, as you just mentioned, on the multi-senior service center. The whole idea of, and I think it's the fear of the unknown as well, that for these this population, the concern that we heard at the subcommittee for hours of testimony, it was the cumulative effect of many of the cuts we're having. So we've tried to make a presentation that would take that into account, including the suggestion of the $25 million block grant. And to the LAO's point, I think it's very important, and I know that we will stay engaged in this on the transition in our own districts to make sure that the transition is thoughtful so that nobody will be unnecessarily um, sort of lost in this whole process. So with that, I would uh, move the recommendations, including the $25 million block grant. Sure. Senator Alquist. I will be supporting the recommendation, but I do have one or two questions. Uh, to prevent transfer trauma, uh, should we establish a fair and safe timeline for DSS to set up uh, a social and respite programs and transfer these uh, participants seamlessly from the ADHC model to the new adult day care model? I'm particularly concerned with those who have Alzheimer's disease or severe dementia uh, who will quickly end up in nursing homes if these programs are not readily available to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does that mean yes? Yes. Okay, thank Senator you. Alquist, I think to tie that down even a little bit more firmly, because it's a, an important point, that I would add to Senator DeSaulnier's motion to include some trailer bill language thank you. that would state that the Department mm -hmm. of Health Care Services will assist in this transition process. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So again, uh, Senator DeSaulnier, thank you for the many hours of hearings that you held allowing for the public to participate, share their concerns. We certainly have heard them. It's not an easy decision for us. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Senator Huff. Um, we, we do share some concerns. We support the governor's proposal here and um, we would be willing to support the reductions that you've identified. Uh, so if we could split the vote and then we would vote no on the block grant portion. Okay. So we'll Split this vote. We'll support the reduction. So the, uh, the, and uh, just a formality, but before we take that vote, uh, let's form a quorum. <laughs> Leno. Here. Huff. Here. Alquist. Here. Anderson. DeSalne. Here. Emerson. Here. Evans. Fuller. Hancock. Here. LaMalfa. Here. Lou. Here. Lowenthal. Here. Rubio. Simidian. Here. Wolk. Here. Wright. Here. Thank Six. you. We have our quorum. Yes. So with respect to Senator Huff's support, his colleague's support for the governor's proposal, we will split the vote. The first vote is for accepting $151 million in savings as a cut to the program. That will pass unanimously. And the second vote is for the $25 million block grant to DHCS, and that will pass Democrats in support, Republicans in opposition. And that is with the trailer bill language. Thank you. So we're going to come back to the other issues starting on page two after we work our way through K through 14 education. So we're going to switch to the Office of Secretary of Education on page 24. Page 24. Good morning. 
Good morning. Um, I can present this issue if you're ready. Thank you. Lori Carney, Department of Finance. Lori, I'm sorry, I didn't get your last name. Carney. Thank you. Uh, the governor's budget proposes... Could you bring that just a little closer, Hugh? Sure. Appreciate it. Is that good, sir? A little better. Okay, thank you. Uh, the governor's budget proposes to streamline government operations and save general fund dollars by eliminating the Office of the Secretary for Education, saving $1.9 million in the budget year and approximately $400,000 general fund in the current year. Uh, associated with the elimination of OSE, we are proposing to increase the State Board of Education's budget by $274,000 and redirecting three positions from the board, or, I'm sorry, the Department of Education. Um, those positions would allow the Board of Education to accept new responsibilities associated with the elimination of the OSE. Um, possible workload would include legislation analysis and special projects and programs. Uh, we're hoping to improve the Board of Education's responsiveness to the legislature, the administration, and the general public um, and provide them the necessary analytical support they've been needing. Thank you. Not a new issue before us. This is something we've debated over the past many years, and I want to thank the governor for his leadership in moving this forward. And just to underscore that these three positions are not new positions. They are just shifting. Correct. Very good. Mm -hmm. Senator Liu. If there's no other discussion, I would move the uh, staff recommendation to approve the governor's proposal. Thank you, Senator. What, no problem. The, uh, Colleagues, uh, we're going to, the recommendation is to uh, accept the governor's proposal, and which includes both the uh, savings of the 1.9 million uh, shifting three positions from the Office of uh, Secretary of Education to the uh, State Board. And I'm going to suggest that you might want to suggest that we split the vote. So that, that, that is uh, exactly what I was going to suggest. The first vote will be for the savings. <laughs> that will pass unanimously. And the shifting of the three positions will pass with Democrats supportive, Republicans uh, voting no. Correct. Moving to page 25 has to do with CalPads and CalTides. Todd Finance. Uh, let me just walk you briefly through this. So as your uh, agenda describes on page 25, uh, the governor's budget does not propose to restore any of the current year vetoed funds for either the CalPads or CalTide system, nor does it propose to authorize any budget year funds for either system. Uh, instead, uh, the governor would like to take a step back and kind of reevaluate where we are on CalPads and take a deeper look at the system and have a broader discussion about student data in general. So to do that, the governor um, has proposed to establish an interagency work group to discuss these issues, and I can tell you that plans are underway to establish that work group. Um, I don't have any additional detail that I can share at this point, but uh, any decision to restore funding um, will ultimately be subject to the decisions made in that work group. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the chair. Yes, Senator Smidian. Could I think I you've got some history with that this. My office and I will be kept informed of opportunities to participate in the conversation, please. I can absolutely assure you that the legislature will have a place at the table. And let me ask that again. Perhaps sure. I wasn't clear. Okay. Could I ask that my office and I be kept informed about opportunities to participate in the work group? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smidian. Let's hear from the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, Jennifer Kuhn from the Legislative Analyst Office. We do think there's urgency in dealing with the current year situation since we're well into the year and the project is still proceeding. Um, so we think the a restoration of something like $3 million uh, would be appropriate. We've actually tried to work with the department to find savings here and there to shave it down to the extent possible so you're only restoring what's absolutely critical for that project. And we've been trying to look for some other federal funds that you might be able to use 
to just give you more opportunities in the budget year because you're also going to be experiencing a budget year shortfall. So we would recommend that you deal with the current year situation, whether it's three million. If you do the three million, which is probably a little bit more than you need, it will get it to conference. And I think the assembly is going to have much less funding so that it will at least give you an opportunity to work toward a compromise moving forward. And that $3 million could conceivably keep CalPADS on track for now as we figure out where we're going. It, it would essentially fund the entire CDE request to keep the project of CalPADS going with a delay in CalTIDS. Right. Mr. Chairman. Senator Smidian. Thank you. Just on this point, um, entirely apart from the larger discussion about the importance of data, particularly in a time of limited resources when we need to make sure we spend what few dollars we have with the best result, um, I think the folks from the LAO's office or finance would be prepared to tell you we've made some commitments already about data to the federal government which were necessary preconditions to acquiring those federal funds. To some extent, if we do not move forward, <coughs> we put the federal funds we've already received at risk uh, for failure to comply with the term. So I wanted to ask if there's someone at the table who could just speak very briefly to that so people understand that there are big dollars at risk behind these medium-sized dollars we're talking about. Part of education. Uh, Aaron Gable, on behalf of the State Superintendent, Tom Torlix in the Department of Education, I'm happy to speak to the Senator's question. Um, yes, I um, would like to reiterate that the Department's request is to separate out the current year discussion in terms of funding from the budget year as the Governor has proposed for the working group. Uh, we do have concerns that is we do not continue to um, provide secure funding for the uh, CalPATS project that has been provided by the federal government that um, it could call into, into question our compliance with our federal reporting if there were to be problems with CalPATS. Um, there is a concern, of course, um, that, that if the legislature and the administration does not continue to support CalPATS that we may not be able to meet our federal reporting requirements for which CalPATS is currently operational and um, providing those reports. Uh, we are um, not going to mince words as, as folks at the here um, know we, there are um, some issues in terms of the performance of the current CalPAD system that the state superintendent is working very hard to rectify. We are actually very much looking forward to the working group that the governor's proposed in order to look at um, the long-term uses of CalPADS and student longitudinal data in the state and um, our happy to announce that we have received approval from the governor's office to convene this working group. We are working hard to set a date, hopefully the first week of March, when the working group can start to discuss the implications for the budget year. But in the meantime, we would ask that the current year funding of uh, the restoration of the $2.9 million uh, be restored in order to not call into question the commitment of the legislature to meet our federal reporting obligations. Thank you. Right. And Ms. Gable. It's accurate to say that the department has determined that the remaining 3.5 million does not need to be restored for CalTIDS in the current year. That is correct. Um, because of some of the uh, delays and concerns that we have with the CalPADS project, the Department of Education and the, has been working with the CTC, and we've chosen to postpone the beginning of the CalTIDS project until the budget year, so we no longer need an approval of any funding for CalTIDS for the current year. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Cable, and uh, thank you, Ms. Kuhn. Senator so, Liu. Uh, with that, I would... Um, move that we support staff's recommendation to restore $3 million in federal dollars to 2010-11 for CDE state operations to continue implementation development of CalPADS um, and to delay funding for 2011-12 until after the May revise to reflect conclusions of the interagency working group request but requested by the governor. Okay. That is the motion. Without any further discussion, this will pass unanimously. Staying with the Department of Education, on page 26, there is trailer bill language. This has to do with the governor's flexibility and fiscal relief proposals. Yeah, again, very briefly, uh, the governor's budget uh, essentially proposes to uh, extend by two years all current flexibility provisions that are in place now. Um, I think from our perspective, we believe that collectively these flexibility provisions will be critical um, for school districts as they try to operate under very constrained resources. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Ms. Gable, you have anything to add? 
Yes, I just would like to add that the state superintendent is supportive of the uh, proposal by the governor to extend these flexibility provisions, not because he doesn't have concerns about some of the programmatic impacts of, that have happened because of flexibility, but because we do believe that in order to exit this uh, era of flex, that more uh, an increase in, in general fund dollars will be needed in order to uh, allow to, uh, to the schools to um, whether that, that difficulty. We would like to have a specific comment on one of the provisions, and that's regarding uh, school district budget reserves. We do not agree that this provision should be extended. Uh, the provision actually does not make any additional funds available or more flexible. It merely deactivates our early warning system that we have if school districts do need to, to dip into their budget reserves. We believe now more than ever that state leadership needs to understand the fiscal straits that our schools are facing and that we should not deactivate activate this warning system so that we know when they are dipping into their reserves. Thank you. Thank you. And this issue of flexibility, of course, is always a debated one. We know there are many differences of opinion. Have you heard the figure that about 85% of school districts are asking for more flexibility? You know, the LAO actually has conducted a survey to this, and so they are probably prepared to, to discuss further what some of the responses have been. Um, I, we do know that one of the, the biggest issues, in addition to the use of the flexibility and the popularity of the flexibility on a local level, is the um, interest and the concern on a local level that the legislature have a comprehensive plan on how to exit this era of flexibility. And um, on behalf of the state board president, uh, Dr. Kirst, and the state superintendent, I would like to say that we are going to be working very closely with the legislature this year on looking at a, a comprehensive school finance reform package that might be a, a way to look at how to exit this time of, of budget uh, difficulty and, and this test pilot to flexibility. Thank you for all of that. We don't need to go any further. Thank you, though, for your uh, offer to do so. And just to reiterate, uh, the governor's proposal is merely to extend the current flexibility for two years, nothing new. Correct. Senator Lou? With that in mind, uh, I would move staff's recommendation to um, accept the governor's proposal to extend the um, existing program flexibility. And also um, just to alert um, folks out there that this spring that we need to also look at long-term school finance and categorical reform proposals that um, in addition to that, uh, programs that could be added to the categorical flexibility programs to better reflect LEA's demands, and to uh, also consider the alignment of current provisions in the categorical flexibility program to better reflect LEA's growth in the additional two-year period, and finally, the fiscal relief provisions to allow LEA's um, flexibility while preserving the state's fiscal early warning system. Thank you. That is our motion, and it passes without objection. Page 27 proposes to reduce the income eligibility ceiling for child care programs. Senator Leno, um, page 27, 28, and 29. These uh, proposals should work together as a package, but um, we'll wait for the Department of Finance to... Very good. Ms. Swan, welcome. Thank you. Um, Sarah Swan, Department of Finance. So the administration has proposed um, a package of a total of 750, pardon me, 750 million um, in um, structural um, ongoing savings in child care. 716 million of that is within Proposition 98. Um, the first issue that you have before you um, is uh, to reduce the income eligibility from 75% of the state mean income to 60% of the SMI. So um, the intent really is to prioritize uh, services for the neediest of families. Um, and that has a, a total savings um, of about $79 million. Um, we are also proposing to eliminate um, child care services for 11 and 12-year-olds, um, thus prioritizing uh, child care services for younger children. Um, and that's a total of about $93 million in savings. $34 million of that is the impact on stage one services. And then finally, we are proposing to uh, reduce remaining funding with the exception of part day preschool. Um, and also the SMI reduction would not apply to part day preschool. Um, 
Remaining uh, funding would be reduced um, in the aggregate by 34.6%. Um, so it would be a, a subsidy reduction. Um, the uh, intent is that the number of children who are served not be reduced. Uh, so the uh, family would uh, pay a co-payment, um, essentially the difference between the subsidy um, and um, the remaining difference between the subsidy and uh, the cost of care. Um, and that is also coupled with a proposal to provide local flexibility, uh, which uh, um, to structure the subsidy um, reduction in a way that would recognize uh, family income differences and um, other factors that could be taken into consideration, such as the age of the child, number of children in care, and so on. Um, and uh, the County Office of Education would coordinate that effort, working with alternative payment agencies, which are the voucher-based programs, as well as Title V centers. Um, and then also they may work with local planning councils. Uh, they determine the local child care needs, um, as well as county welfare directors. Um, and I also would just like to, to point out that um, California does have the um, most generous subsidy policies overall when compared to other large states. Um, and specifically with respect to the SMI, and the LEO has also done some research in this area, um, uh, other large states are at 60% of the SMI or lower. Um, and finally, I would just like to say that um, while we are proposing this package, we are open to a mix of um, different reductions. However, um, again, just to reiterate, we're proposing ongoing structural reductions, and so we can't concur with anything that um, a package that doesn't uh, hit that mark. We Thank understand. you. And as we have said from the start, we are focused on the number. None of this pleasant. Uh, as you have said, the proposal by its design in this environment of ever shrinking resources is to protect the neediest of families. And that's what you've done here. You've touched on the elimination of services for 11 and 12 year olds as well. The third page, uh, which is 29, the third of the three pages of this package of child care has to do with the 34.6% reduction in subsidy levels. You want to talk about that as well and we'll take all this together. Uh, certainly. Um, I can just speak a little bit more specifically to that. So it is uh, a reduction that's in the aggregate, and then we're proposing trailer bill language that would um, have uh, the, the county offices of, of education working with the providers um, to structure the subsidy reduction um, that in a way that, that uh, does take um, family income differences into account. Um, so, uh, but a, again, the the um, family would pay the difference in the form of a co-payment that would be paid directly to um, to the provider in place of the state's administrative agents. So, yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Gable, do you have any comments with regard to this? You know, you know I do, but if, if possible, I'd like to defer to the LAO first um, in terms of their their input. I just I don't want us to be repeating each other. If that's, that's all right. Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, Rachel Ehlers, LAO. We'll be very brief since we discussed this at great length in subcommittee. Um, we, uh, in recognition that these are very difficult reductions you need to make and that they will affect children and families, we had offered some guiding principles to the legislature in considering making reductions to the child care package, focusing on direct services for children rather than administrative and support activities to the degree possible, prioritizing services for the most needy children to the degree possible. Um, so we think that that uh, making reductions based on age could be one definition of need, so that's one consideration to look at. Uh, I, similarly, with the state median income, if you need to shrink your, your program, then shrinking it to focus on the lowest income families makes sense. But our third guiding principle was really to look at balancing access and quality to care, and we had concerns that the governor's 35% reduction and the copay that it would require low income families to make would not balance either quality programs that have to go to the lowest in, uh, charging providers uh, or access because they wouldn't be able to find enough of them. So uh, we had suggested suggested that you look for other options rather than that. Thank you, Ms. Ehlers. Okay. Ms. Gable. Um, so on behalf of the superintendent, I wanted to, to reiterate his extreme concern about the magnitude of these cuts to the child care program and what it would signal in terms of, of, of the 
the dismantling of the investments that California has made to date in our high quality child care system and um, to be consistent with the LAO's uh, values and principles that they have put forward, we would urge the legislature to reject the administration's proposal and to explore a, a, a different prioritized way of looking at um, how you want to target these cuts in order to not sacrifice the investments that have been made, particularly oh, yeah. in uh, right. allowing these, the infrastructure of our child care system to survive this budget crisis. Um, we had conveyed a number of individual concerns with various parts of the proposal in subcommittee that I won't um, belabor uh, the, the committee with today, but we were asked to uh, respond to the, our concerns that the overlay of the 35 percent reduction across the board and the reduction to 60 percent SMI, that it would not um, be reaching the, the priority of, of helping our neediest families in that they could not afford the fees and the, the new context in which they'd be needing to get child care. And so we did conduct a survey at the request of the subcommittee of our providers to have a better understanding of what the 35 percent across the board reduction would look like. Uh, we had uh, 300 plus affected contractors participate, approximately 50 percent of the department's contractors. This survey did not include uh, state preschool, pre-K literacy, our APs, or CalWORKs. However, um, the projections from these 300 contractors is that over 60,000 children would not be served under this um, scenario, that um, over 53,000 families would not be served. We would be looking at staff layoffs of in the magnitude of 11,000 or more, and that we would be looking at facility closures across the state of over 1,000. Um, this is just from the 50 percent projected from the small sub-portion. We're looking at 1,021 centers that are projecting they would close under this current proposal, and another 1,000 in lost uh, family child care homes that are currently part of the network. Thank so you. the magnitude of the impact to the infrastructure cannot be um, overly emphasized. Thank you, Ms. Gable. I want to thank you for reiterating that word infrastructure so many times because I think Ms. Swan would agree with me that what the governor has been proposing in the broader architecture of his budget approach is not only trying to spare as many families and children students who aspire to a higher education, those who are impacted by our social safety net, all of the, the human impacts, but beyond that, a layer deeper, that if we continue to cut beyond a certain level, we begin to dismantle the very infrastructure of the state of California, which is not so easily repaired or restored overnight. And that is why I believe he's taken this balanced approach. And so just to make that point again, the infrastructure is so very precious and uh, at risk. Senator Liu. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And with that, um, we would move to accept staff's recommendations to um, the Senate package amounts to $425 million in problematic reductions versus the governor's reduction of $716 million. And we're using various savings to make up the difference within Prop 98. What that means on page 27, the income eligibility um, to adopt the governor's proposed trailer bill language to reduce yeah. child care income eligibility ceiling to 60% of SMI and to extend the reduction to include preschool for an additional 70 million in savings. And on page 28. We'll, uh, we'll take them a page at a time. Okay, so I'm we'll sorry. Back in just a moment. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just to point out that in your motion to uh, extend the income eligibility ceiling reduction to preschool, so that's an additional $70 million that the governor had not proposed, Correct. which would go into our column of where we're finding money to be able to sustain so many of the other things we're trying right. to sustain. So that is the motion. Uh, uh, that will pass without objection. Then on page 28. Uh, to approve the governor's proposal with modified trailer bill language that deprioritize 11 and 12 year olds for state subsidized child care, except for those children in non traditional hours of care. 
then prioritize 11 and 12 year olds for the wait list for before and after school programs and allows uh, 11 and 12 year olds to attend a before or after school program at another school within their district that offers those programs. <coughs> Senator Huff. Yes, th this is less than the governor's proposal, which we're prepared to support, but we will support your motion today. Very good. So without further comment, that also will pass without objection. And then on page 29, the motion is to reject the governor's 35% reju reduction approve a 13% across the board cut that excludes preschool and stage one and stage two because they are entitlement programs. Approve a reduction of license exempt provider rates from 80% to 60% of a license provider rate. And approve a reduction to administration from 17.5% to 15%. Thank you, Senator Lou. Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, while you stated earlier when we started discussing this subject that we were looking at uh, one number, we don't think all numbers are created equal. In this case, while you're scoring the savings, there's 200 million that are one-time funds, which leaves yet another structural imbalance next year. And so we're concerned about that. So um, we are not able to support this portion of, the, uh, of your recommendation. Thank you, Senator Huff. Uh, just a difference of opinion on this reason. We are, of course, moving in the direction of rejecting the 34.6%, but reducing it to a 13% reduction is out of concerns that Ms. Gable articulated so well that the very infrastructure could be at risk. So with that said, uh, this will pass with Democrats in support and Republicans opposing. We're going to move on to Prop 98. And that's page 30. Committee members. Department of Finance. Thank you. Elisa Wynn with Department of Finance. Um, the governor proposed, as you can see on page 30, a total Prop 98 funding level of 49.3 billion. Um, included in that proposal was also new deferrals of 2.1 billion for K-12 and 129 million for community colleges. <laughs> the intent of the proposal um, was to maintain program funding um, at current year levels. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Mm -hmm. Legislative Analyst Office. Good morning, Edgar Cabral with the Legislative Analyst Office, and I believe you're um, receiving a handout right now that summarizes the Senate's uh, Proposition 98 package. Um, the, the proposal, uh, the package would, would fund at, at 49.3, um, exactly the same number as the governor. Um, as you had just uh, voted on previously, the, the reductions to child care would be, uh, the programmatic reductions to child care would be less, but they, um, some funding would be replaced with unspent funds from prior years from Proposition 98 and other one-time funds. Um, there, there were also a, a few uh, minor changes, such as, for example, um, the, the proposal does not fund the emergency repair program as the governor had uh, funded. Thank you, sir. Ms. Gable? The state superintendent would just like to reiterate for the committee um, the, the fact that um, the, this budget, though the governor has done a, a wonderful job in trying to protect Prop 98 from further cuts because of the disproportionate share that they have carried over the last few years in terms of the budget cut and the real, um, real budget cuts. Uh, that there are cuts to schools that will be taking place in the next, in the budget year, and that is the loss of our ARA funds, uh, the loss of approximately $5.8 billion in the Federal Recovery Act dollars, and school districts will be grappling with those cuts during the budget year, and so please rem remember this when um, going through the rest of the process. Thank Thank you. Very good, thank you. So where we are recommending the legislature go is uh, with the governor in terms of sustaining Prop 98 funding given the inordinate proportion of cuts that 
K through 12 in particular has taken over recent years. We all have heard from our school districts, we've heard from our superintendents, we've heard from our teachers, we've heard from our parents, we've heard from everyone that uh, should we not reinvest and protect our current levels of funding that we're really at risk of changes to our public education system I don't think anyone would want to even consider. So I appreciate the governor's proposal. Senator Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so with that in mind, um, this K-14 Proposition 98 package covers ongoing and one-time funding for K-12 education, including child care and the community colleges. And the package provides $49.3 billion in ongoing Prop 98 funding for K-14 education in 2011-12, the same level proposed by the governor. Um, with that, I would um, move that we approve the K-14 Prop 98 package as detailed um, and that um, approving some modifications within the funding levels, including reallocation of ongoing Prop 98 funds and appropriations of additional one-time savings to backfill some child care reductions proposed by the governor. Thank you, Senator Lou. Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is an area where we disagree with the governor because it is predicated upon uh, tax increase and uh, we're not prepared to do that. We also have been listening to people in the district, particularly the voters that rejected the extension of taxes two years ago and even the last November rejected um, the car tax for parks, the um, robbing local government funds. They allowed a majority vote on um, the budget, but then they made it more difficult to raise fees and taxes. So we don't think there's an appetite out there to raise taxes as much as this is something that everybody is interested in, public education. So having said that, and because it is predicated upon those very taxes, we uh, have to vote no on this. Thank you, Senator Huff. Uh, respectfully recognizing the difference of opinion here. Uh, you know, if we presume that once voters speak, they should never speak again. Arnold Schwarzenegger would never have stepped foot in this building. So uh, we think the people should get to vote. And that's why we can support the proposal as the governor has proposed it. And so this will pass with the Prop 98 package passes with Democrats in support and Republicans in opposition. Thank you, Ms. Gable. Moving on to page 31, community colleges. <coughs> First item is the proposal to increase student fees from 26 to $36 per unit. Ed Hansen, Department of Finance. Yes, uh, as noted in the agenda, the governor's budget proposed a $400 million reduction to, in Prop 98 to the community colleges. Uh, as part of the uh, governor's budget, the governor proposes to increase student fees by $10 to generate uh, $110 million, which is retained within the community college budget to help minimize the impact of the $400 million reduction to community colleges. Thank you, and if we were to go to 36, we'd still be lowest in the nation, and just above us would be New Mexico, I understand, at $40 per unit. That's correct, California would still be the lowest. Is there a determined figure as to what the national average is? Uh, the most recent number, that I believe, was around $100 per unit, it was the average, 90 to 100. 90 to 100 across the country is the average? I believe so, yes. If we're as low as we are, how high are some? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, Senator, but I can Conceivably get much that higher than 100. Obviously, if it, that's yes. the average. Uh, LIO has yes, it. Mr. Steenhausen. Yes, Paul Steenhausen with the Legislative Analyst Office. Uh, the highest uh, is uh, in the five, six thousand dollar range. That, so, California Community Colleges for a student <laughs> taking 30 units currently pays 780 dollars. The national per uh, per year, the national average is over 3,000. Uh, some states, um, Vermont, New Hampshire, Minnesota, a um, couple others charge in the five or six thousand dollar range. The average is about 3,100. Thank you. That's helpful, Mr. Steenhausen. Thank you. 
Okay. Yes, Dan Troy, on behalf of the Chancellor's Office, uh, we'd like to note that this is a 38% increase uh, over one year, and uh, we do appreciate, given the other uh, reductions that are happening in our budget, that we believe these, this fee revenue can help support our students better. So we'd ask that, uh, as part of your consideration, that you would not ask us to grow, but let us allow us to let us use this fee revenue to offset uh, the $400 base cut. So put that in our, to our base apportionment. Thank you, Mr. Troy. <laughs> All right, Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm recognizing that just about half of community college students get BOG waivers already, Board of Governor waivers, and are not paying these fees. I would um, like to move that we do raise them from 26 to $36 per unit. Thank you, Senator. Without objection, that's the order of the committee. Page 32. Mr. Hansen, moving on to page 32, the census date change proposal, something that I know has caused some distress to some. <laughs> yes, at Hansen Department of Finance, uh, as we discussed, the governor's budget proposed $400 million reduction to community colleges. Uh, the administration believes that this should not be a pure workload reduction. We were looking for ways to uh, minimize the impact to students to retain course offerings. So as part of one option would be to reform the census date. The census date is currently after the completion of 20% of the, of the course. Our proposal would shift the uh, census date to the end of the term. Uh, we believe that that would achieve approximately $800 million savings. However, the proposal is to reinvest half of that money into increased rates in for specified courses to incentivize colleges offering courses in, uh, in transfer courses and uh, vocational education. Uh, the bottom line is that the, that the administration is looking for reforms to incentivize colleges to provide uh, cor off course offerings in key areas and also we're considering uh, if there are any efficiencies that could be achieved in order to minimize the okay. impact of st on, st on students. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Mr. Troy? Uh, yes, we'd urge you to uh, reject this proposal. Uh, we think this would be, this is a major policy change for the colleges to undertake uh, at a short period of time. We believe there'd be very serious unintended consequences, uh, such as uh, the fact that different colleges have very different completion rates based on the populations that they serve. Uh, it also discourages the offerings of important transfer courses, such as math and science, which have, tend to have lower completion rates than do easier courses. Uh, we suggest to the extent that we want reforms based on student success that we defer that to the SB 1143 Student Success uh, Task Force, which will make recommendations to the legislature next spring. On that point, we want to recognize and thank Senator Liu for her leadership in Absolutely. establishing this task force, looking at ways to encourage student success and get those numbers up. Absolutely. Uh, not to encourage you, but if you have anything to add, Mr. Steenhouse, if briefly. We share the concern of many that the current funding mechanism creates a, an incentive for colleges to get students in the seats early, but not necessarily a strong incentive for them to uh, help students complete. Uh, really, this mechanism sends a mis mixed message to uh, community colleges and saying, we want you to focus on helping these students get through, succeeding, but we're gonna pay you based on how many students happen to be enrolled in the third week. And, and we've heard uh, our office uh, uh, colleges say, you know, it's, it's uh, a dilemma for us because we know based on research, our own research, that mandating uh, orientation, assessment, counseling is important for student success. But at the same time, we don't want to necessarily turn off students to enrolling. This is especially in years in which uh, they, need the, they need the enrollment in order to keep their base and to grow and get more money to the system. It, it's also a questionable practice, the fact that taxpayers are paying for students that might have dropped three months before. <laughs> uh, so we do support a change and we recognize along with uh, the Chancellor's Office that this it does require a lot of thought, uh, a lot of uh, modeling decisions to be made. So we recommend uh, the legislature not tie the proposed uh, $400 million apportionment uh, reduction to this proposal, but rather think of ways to target cuts uh, so that the highest priority missions and students are preserved. Thank you, sir. Senator Liu. 
With that, the uh, motion is to reject without prejudice to reconsider this and other cost-saving options um, this spring. That is the motion, and without objection, it will pass. Page 33 has to do with capital outlay projects. Ms. Gunn, welcome. Hello. Proceed. Oh, these are um, capital outlay projects. Could you get a little closer to your microphone, please? I'm sorry. Teresa Gunn, Department of Finance. These are the capital outlay projects that um, the Chancellor's Office requested for the community colleges using their 2006 general obligation bond funds and pretty much the remaining amount of those bond funds. All of these projects are continuing. We have already done the design work through the general obligation bonds. These are for construction dollars, and the appropriation of these now and potential moving forward would help them to take advantage of this um, construction market, get, in pe get people moving in jobs, and potentially get these projects built as inexpensively as possible. You like that? Yes. Mr. Troy, anything to add? Uh, I concur with the Department of Finance's so All right. Points. Mr. Steenhausen? We have not had an opportunity to review these. And okay. Senator Liu? We recommend uh, or we concur with staff's recommendation to reject without prejudice for reconsideration this spring. That is the motion and without objection. We'll move forward. Thank you, Carol. So that concludes our work on education committee members. We're going to move back to the other open issues where we left off. Yeah. And that would be page three, back with the Department of Public Health. No, oh, so sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm just off by a day, folks. That's all right. We've got a vote only for the Department of Social Services. This has to do with uh, budget bill language for reappropriation authority. It's a technical fix. This was accidentally voided authority, and we will correct that with this vote only motion. So moved. And that's uh, without objection. Staying with the Department of Social Services, we're on page four, dealing with the governor's CalWORKs proposal to reduce funding for child care, welfare to work services, and the single allocation. Charlie Mesker with the department, uh, welfare to work deputy director. And um, could you also get a little closer to your microphone, please? Mr. Chair and members. What you have before you is sort of a package of proposals that the governor has put forward on the CalWORKs program. Uh, they all sort of work together uh, to achieve a substantial amount of savings. Uh, we, uh, rec we recognize that uh, we are in an extremely difficult fiscal situation this year, and um, we are putting forward a package of proposals that in combination would achieve about $1.5 billion worth of savings. Um, as part of that effort, we have, we have attempted in many ways to maintain as much as possible the critical safety net that we have for our most vulnerable families. What we have here is a package of proposals that is, it is summarized on pages four, five, and six. And uh, what's included there is three major proposals that I can over outline for you quickly. On page five, or, or page uh, four, I believe, is the um, unallocated reduction to the single allocation. As you may remember, 
in the last couple of years, we've had this uh, unallocated reduction that has been in place. We've often referred to it as the short-term changes that were proposed in ABX4 last uh, two sessions ago. And what is um, put forward this year is, is a continuation of those um, unallocated reductions, but, uh, but allowing the short-term changes to actually expire. Um, they're, I think, proposed to expire on June 30th of this year. The, the thinking behind that is essentially that when you put all of the package of reforms together, it doesn't necessarily make sense to move forward with the short-term reforms when you also uh, package it with the 48-month firm time limit and with the, um, the um, unallocate, uh, the um, transfer of dollars to, to the Student Aid Commission and then the modifications that are being proposed for the safety net. So essentially, there would be uh, $376 million worth of reductions made, but at the same time, uh, we would continue the flexibility that was provided in those reforms for counties to utilize their mental health and substance abuse money interchangeably with their single allocation. But families, uh, counties would have the authority, as they have today, to grant good cause to people if there is inadequate money to cover their supportive services for them to participate. So that's, that's the uh, first proposal that is there on page, page four. Moving on to page five, in tandem with that proposal would be a new firm 48-month time limit that would be imposed on CalWORKs families. And essentially that time limit would, would be retroactive to the original implementation date of the CalWORKs program, which began in January of 98. And that 48-month time limit would be firm and and only permit exemptions that are federally um, allowable at, uh, under the federal law. So essentially what you would have is um, a time limit that, that would take place on July of, of the coming fiscal year and it would um, impact a number of families in, in a, a couple of ways. One, if, the, if families are willing to continue to meet work requirements as prescribed by um, the federal government, then they would continue to have access to California's safety net. And then if, um, if they chose not to meet those work requirements, then their families would be removed from, from assistance. And that proposal uh, nets a savings of approximately 83 832 million dollars, or almost 833 million dollars. And then along with that proposal is a grant cut that, um, that gets us to the full 1.5 billion dollars worth of savings. And that particular proposal is outlined on page six. And um, essentially what we're proposing here is to reduce CalWORKs grant levels by approximately 13 percent. The MAP level would go from, um, for a family of three, from $694 to um, $604 effective July 1 of 2011. That's a $90 reduction in grant, but it would be offset by a $25 um, increase in CalFresh benefits. Uh, essentially, that would achieve in the budget year approximately $405 million worth of savings and would affect the entire caseload and, and, and in some instances there would be approximately 5,300 families that would be ineligible for benefits once the new grant uh, levels go into effect. And um, as, as I think we've probably said before, much of what you have in front of you are proposals that we would not normally be proposing if we were not in this dire fiscal circumstance. And we have tried to minimize the impact on families as much as possible, but essentially uh, targeting as much of this money, money and these services to the lowest income families that we have in California. Thank you for the succinct presentation of what is a very complicated package of information, Ms. Metzger. 
Mr. Trevinka? Nothing to add. It's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Todd Bland with the Analyst Office. I think your agenda lays out the proposals very well, and Ms. Metzger added some further explanation. I would only draw your attention to one comment on the um, on the first proposal dealing with the block grant. Uh, we believe that um, although counties would have the authority under current law to use their good cause authority to grant um, essentially on a case-by-case -case basis, um, deal with the reduction in services and their inability to serve, we think that's an inefficient way of doing it. And to the extent the committee elects to go with a reduction here in that, you should be thinking along the lines of uh, continuing the current law exemptions. Thank you, Mr. Bland. So, colleagues, we have uh, Sophie's choices before us, and I think the major policy debate we have here is to continue funding for services for participants in the program or to potentially continue support for the hundreds of thousands of children who are at potential risk of being cut off if we don't make some amendments to the governor's proposal. Uh, Senator Solny, I know you spent uh, many, many hours in your subcommittee reviewing all of this. Uh, where are you? Well, I, I would just add to your comments is the, that the long hearings, of course, in sub three were all consistent, I think, with what staff brought up, is to try to be as thoughtful as possible while trying to still um, achieve the savings, savings, I should say. So I appreciate all of your comments and be happy to try to, um, at the appropriate time, weave our way through the uh, staff recommendations. Why don't we uh, start with the issues on page four? regarding the reduction of funding for the single allocation and then also with regard to page seven, adopting the LAO's alternative proposals. So um, just so for clarity, um, I, I think it's best to read this. So the motion would be on uh, item number one in the staff recommendations under CalWORKS would be to approve the governor's proposal to reduce funding for the, of the single allocation for child, uh, child care welfare to work and administration costs by $376 million, correspondingly to extend the stationary, stationary changes and exemptions for parents of young children that were enacted in 2009 and 2010. Then uh, number two, further reduce the single allocation by another 100 million for a total reduction of 476 million and to the extent necessary to expand upon the existing statutory exemptions to provide direction regarding the implementation of this reduction. And then finally, as you mentioned on page seven under this um, section, this is number three, again on the staff recommendations for CalWORKS issues and uh, the motion is to adopt the LAO's alternative proposal on page seven to simplify the earned income disregard to include 50% of all relevant earnings effective June 1, 2011 and expand the state's participation in the AB 98 subsidized employment program. Further savings from the earned income disregard change would be approximately 17 million in uh, budget year 2010-11 and 200 million in budget year 11 and 12 the subsidized employment program changes would be cost neutral. Thank you, Senator. And again, given the complexity of all of this, there are copies of these recommendations with the sergeant. So if anyone in the audience does not yet have them, they are available. And again, uh, thank you, Senator Saulnier. With regard specifically to the uh, further reduction of the single allocation by another $100 million that gives us the allowance to and we'll get to that in just a moment, uh, potentially save the uh, funding for the children. Senator Emerson. Uh, to the legislative uh, analyst's office, um, how, how long uh, can one be employed on the subsidized uh, employment practice now? Under current law, under the, uh, proposed, uh, the current law we refer to as AB 98, the subsidized employment program of the NILO legislation um, two years ago, it's a six months is the current limit. So that is the motion as described by Senator DeSaulnier and without objection, it does pass. So that takes care of page four. 
and page seven. And so moving on to page five. Ms. Metzger? Oh, you've done that as well. All right. Uh, you have been very thorough in your presentation. You've gone all the way through page eight. So, uh, Senator DeSonia, I'll leave it to you then for the uh, subsequent motions. Okay. We'll go uh, again working off the staff recommendations for the CalWORKS issues. Uh, this is number four, is which is on page six. And the motion is to approve the governor's proposal to reduce maximum grants by 5%, 5%, excuse me, effective June 1 of 2011 and reject the remainder of the grant cut proposed by the administration. The savings would be approximately $195 million. And Mr. Bland, would you happen to know if uh, we were to go with this, or the, the governor's proposal, go with a 13%, that would take us back to 1989 levels? I don't know that one off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Where's 13? If, if memory serves me in the subcommittee, we're, already be not, we're at 89. This would take us back to 1984. I, think. I don't think we have a year. Maybe 1884. Pete Chervinger with Department of Social Services. I, I, I'm, I don't offhand have, have my chart with me, but I can confirm what you just said. We are currently at the 1989 level. I'm not sure what, what year this takes us. I stand us. corrected. So this would, the proposal takes us back to 1884. If, if I may, on grant levels, on, on the, I believe uh, what I discussed in the subcommittee was the um, historically looking back over the last several decades, when you combine food stamps now known as CalFresh when the, with the CalWORKs benefit, typically the total package was in the upper 70s, 80 percent of the federal poverty guideline range for a family of three. Under the governor's proposal, that was going to push us very much into the low 70s. Thank you. So we're going to uh, split the motion by Senator Saulnier. The first half of it is to approve the governor's proposal to reduce the maximum grant by 5%. And that passes without objection. The second motion is to reject the remainder of the grant cut, and that will pass with Democrats in support and Republicans in opposition. Mr. Chairman, that brings us to uh, Number five, again, on the staff recommendations. And the motion is to approve the governor's proposal to reduce the time limit for adults to receive assistance to 48 months and make it effective again June 1st of 2011, but to reject the components of the proposal that will, would alter uh, policies regarding those adults' exemptions from work requirements. And further, period. That's the first motion. That rejection. Yes. Okay. Right. All right, thank you, Senator. We're going to again break that motion into two. The, the first one will be to approve the governor's proposal to reduce the time limit and to reject the components of the proposal that would alter the policies regarding the adults' exemptions. And that passes unanimously. The second motion then would be to reject the governor's proposal to apply the 48-month time limit to the safety net for children. And that will pass with Democrats in support and Republicans in opposition. Mr. Chairman, the, the last two motions, again, are uh, number six and number seven, and um, I would move both of those. Uh, number six is on page eight, and number seven is uh, in the child care handout. Thank you, Senator. And that motion will pass unanimously. Then we have one more. And then the last one, um, number s actually in the very bottom after number seven is staff recommendations approving the governor's proposed trailer bill language to repeal specified long-term changes that were enacted as part of the 0910 budget. Okay. And that will pass with Democrats in support and Republicans in opposition. Uh, I'm sure without any effort, we've confused you all. So uh, the results of the votes and all of the recommendations as moved uh, will be listed on our website. So for those who are looking for something to do on Friday night, you've now got a date. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. Jay Kapoor with the Department of Finance. Um, just wanted to point out that um, uh, while, you know, the, the actions here, the, the savings associated, um, appear to be achievable. Uh, 
finance and the department will be working to um, come up with you know more solid uh, numbers on uh, these savings proposals. So these are, we, we, we're fine with, with these estimates at this point, but we'll be working with the department to refine them. Thank you, that is certainly uh, your, your job, and uh, I assure you we have scrubbed them well, so we're, we're confident that we've paid for it all. So that takes us to page nine. Staying with the Department of Social Services, uh, we're moving on to in-home <coughs> support, supportive services. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Eileen Carroll. I'm the Deputy Director with Adult Programs at the Department of Social Services. And the administration's proposals for the in-home supportive services program total savings of, of approximately $436 million. The proposals were designed in an effort to ensure that savings could be achieved while at the same time minimizing the impacts to the recipients in the program through targeting and through very careful evaluations. The first proposal on our list is on page nine, and this proposal is for the elimination of domestic and related services for those who live in shared living arrangements. 73% of the individuals in the IHSS program live in a shared living arrangement with a family member. This proposal would look at the services that deal with housekeeping and laundry and shopping and those activities and would basically eliminate those services where the family members are already meeting those activities in common. So if you're in a situation where the family doesn't provide those services, your meals are pureed, for instance, because you, you don't sit down and eat with the family, those services would continue. But if you do sit down with your whole family, and it is currently what we call prorated, those services would be eliminated under this proposal. There are exceptions built into it. An individual will be able to get a medical certification de defining how that their needs ca can't be met in common, and they'd also be able to have the social worker observe um, if an individual in the home is mentally or physically incapable of performing it. And in those situations, they would not be reduced those hours. What would become of a situation if there were two family members, both recipients of IHS services? Well, currently, if they're both IHSS recipients, it's probably a situation. Are you talking about a situation where they're providing services for each other, or there's an outside provider who comes into the home? Take them one at a time. Okay. If they have an outside provider who comes in the home, more than likely there wouldn't be any change to their activities. If, on the other hand, they're providing services to each other, they would be considered prorated activities. And then there would still be the opportunity for them to look at the medical certification or the capacity issue. Okay. We're going to move on to page 10. The administration's proposal is looking at what we call an across-the-board reduction in IHSS total authorized hours. Uh, right now, it's, it's approximately at 8.4 percent that's being discussed. We did implement a reduction of 3.6 on February 1st. The combination would create a 12 percent overall across-the-board reduction. For the average person in IHSS, a 12% reduction is a little over 10 hours, just to put scope. But there obviously are people who are, have a greater impact and a lesser impact, but that's our average hours. So if you're receiving 87 hours a month of services, that's about what your reduction would be. Um, what we have done is designed a, a, a supplemental care application process to accompany this reduction so that the individual would be able to apply to the county, have their case reviewed for a, a criteria that allows us to look at their the critical uh, personal care services and their mental capacity and their risk for out-of-home placement and have their hours fully restored, modified to some degree, 
or look for other community resources that could provide that support. It provides an individualized review of their situation so that again, the goal here is to mitigate potential harm that could happen to someone. Page 11. Again, this is an effort to ensure that IHSS is reaching the correct population. The goal here is that we would have a medical uh, certification by doctors, uh, public health nurses, other medical professionals who, before you'd enter the program, would designate that you had a, basically a need, that you had some functional limitations and they could describe what those were. Uh, for those in the program, when the social worker comes out to do a reassessment, at that point, they would ask them to obtain this medical certification. Now, in many cases, uh, social workers may have medical information already from doctors that could be utilized in this. Individuals with relationships with medical professionals would be able to mail the form to those people and have them sent back. Again, the goal here is to ensure that we're targeting the correct people and, and ensure that we have the money to serve those who really need this. And was your term of art uh, other related medical professionals? What, what term did you use? Yes, other medical professionals. Okay, we'll have to work out those details in some travel bill language? Yes. So Right now I think the, the language states public health nurses and physicians, but there's also been a lot of discussion about extending that to physical therapists. And occupational to therapists. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So page, page 12. Page 12 actually is um, not our proposal. LAO. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Meredith Worden with the Legislative Analyst Office. Uh, the committee staff identifies in your agenda a new um, state plan option for uh, the Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act, uh, also known as the Federal Health Care Reform um, Law, that would provide um, additional federal match for attendance services, and this option is known as the community first choice option. This additional match would come with several requirements, as your staff agenda notes, those who meet um, need nursing facility care. We also understand that there is a maintenance of effort related to this requirement. Um, in addition, there are guidance and regulations still forthcoming for this option. It is expected to be available October of this year. Um, we believe it is important for the state to go after uh, federal funds that are available such as these. However, we think it is premature to score the savings of this magnitude for this option at this time. I think you want the next page. No. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah, Department of Defense. Uh, do you agree on the caseload numbers, or do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, caseload on, on the waiver, yeah, excuse me. On, on this issue? Yes, on this issue. Um, we actually agree with uh, LAO um, that it would be premature to uh, adopt these savings at this point without um, further information from the federal government on how this is going to work. All right, thank you. Very good. That's page 12. And then uh, last page of this package is page 13 with regard to the caseload revised estimates. Well, I'll keep it very short. Um, you know, clearly when we developed the governor's budget, we used the best available information we had at the time. Time has passed. We have more information available. But historically, we re-estimate caseload at the May revision. So I'm not prepared to comment on the numbers presented in the agenda. Uh, but, but, but we do acknowledge that the committee would have access to more recent data than we did at, in the development of the governor's budget. Uh, can we acknowledge there has been a somewhat significant drop in caseload in recent years? In recent in years, growth, yes. 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 Yeah. yes, especially compared to historical trends, yes. Right. Okay, very good. All right, uh, Ms. Carroll, just going back. Uh, on, yes. on that caseload savings issue, um, committee members, i just like to point out that um, there, 
a portion of these savings we would argue are already captured in uh, the governor's budget. Uh, as you recall, uh, as part of the 2009 Budget Act, there were various program integrity um, uh, <laughs> Program, program in integrity activities that were adopted for IHSS. And with that, there were some uh, savings also adopted. Um, at, at, it was a, a netted to $130 million. That $130 million in savings is still captured in the, it's still reflected in the governor's budget for 11-12. So, we think there could be some double counting here if these savings are adopted and those uh, program integrity savings remain at the same level. Program integrity. <laughs> Hurdles that some people could not surmount. So the caseload went down and uh, the question is, is whether we're double counting dollars. We'll of course be working with you to substantiate our dollars. So Ms. Carroll, going back to the issues on page nine. There, there is one final issue on page go, 14. Go right ahead. Okay. And, and this this targets our IHSS advisory committees that yes. are utilized through the counties and the public authority process. And it eliminates 1.6 million um, and reduce and removes the mandate to perform this activity. Right. Thank you. Okay. So with regard to your proposal uh, about who we're going to uh, fund and who not in the delivery of the services. Uh, talk about a non-related roommate. The so again, we're talking about there are some shared activities, some shared costs. Uh, would you include in those shared costs the making of a bed? The making of the bed actually isn't part of the domestic and related services. The cleaning and the vacuuming of the house would be included. Laundry? Laundry is one of those services. So what if your roommate, who is an IHSS recipient, you're helping out, suddenly has very soiled, I don't want to get too graphic here, but if they're blood or other kinds of things, it's not your average roommate situation. You're suggesting that they should not be covered? No, I, I think what we're saying is in a situation where an individual has a unique medical need, and I would consider incontinence in that category, there could be a medical exception that would allow them to continue to receive those related service hours. Hmm? Yeah, all right. Very good. Uh, Senator Saulnier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, again, um, we had a lot, many hours of heartfelt and um, informative testimony, particularly on the issue you were just addressing. And as this program evolves, of course, we're all learning new things, but the trying to keep the integrity of the promise to serve people in their homes and in their community, and also being consistent with the earlier comments I made on our actions in the last two days and today, to protect the integrity of the programs, capture the savings, but also be aware of the cumulative effect um, to many Californians. I would make two motions and try to do this as simply as possible without reading all of them unless you would prefer me to. Um, but the first motion would be on items one, which is on uh, one, four, and five, and these are the items on the staff recommendations for IHSS. And just for your reference, they are pages 9, 10, 11 in the agenda, so I would move those recommendations. Thank you, Senator. So, uh, thank you, Senator. Clarify for everyone. So the motion has to do with uh, items on pages 11, 9, 10, and 11, 11, which are items of the recommendation list of 1, 4, and 5. And that will pass without objection. Second motion, Mr. Chairman, would be on items number two and three on page 13 and 12, and I would so move. Thank you, Senator. And that motion will pass with Democrats in support and Republicans in opposition. And then we still have page 14. Senator DeSalnier. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, um, this is a, a fairly emotional issue um, to allow the, the clients to have a voice in the authorities. So I would, I would move the staff recommendations. We're trying to capture savings. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. okay, so I will read it to be clear. Uh, the recommendation is to approve the governor's proposal and trailer bill language to suspend the mandate for counties to have IHS advisory committees and approve a $1.4 million of the governor's proposed reduction, reductions and then further to um, try to help with the advisory committees in the local level to reject the remaining $168,000 reduction in order to provide some funding for advisory functions required in the counties that opt to have public authorities. That Thank you, motion. Senator. And that's going to pass unanimously. <clears throat> so that concludes our work with the Department of Social Services. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Mr. Trevinka, Mr. Bland. Thank you, LEO. Thank you. Okay, all right. So moving on to the CPUC. Page 15, the first issue deals with gas consumption surcharge fund. Leo? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tiffany Roberts, Legislative Analyst Office. Um, your staff agenda lays out an option that relates to the gas consumption surcharge, which is a fund that receives revenues from a public goods charge on natural gas ratepayers. This particular option would transfer $262 million from the gas consumption surcharge for general fund savings. The surcharge funds broad areas of interest such as the California Alternate Rates for Energy Program, the Low Income Energy Efficiency Program, as well as other types of energy efficiency programs that are administered through investor-owned utilities such as PG&E, SoCal Edison, as well as S dg and &E. um, The programs provide discounts and rebates to customers for purchasing energy efficient home appliances such as gas stoves and furnaces. The low income program provides appliance upgrades such as water heaters um, and stoves. This proposal would leave intact the CARE program and would make a one-time transfer of the remaining funds. Um, also, for some additional information, the CPUC has authorized a $3.2 billion energy efficiency program, and a large portion of that program would remain intact. And this one-time fund transfer is modest compared to that program. So with this $262 million fund transfer, what becomes of the energy efficiency for is it the not low income? For low, for low income. Low income. Yeah, for the low income consumers. Um, for the low income energy efficiency portion. So what that, what that generally does, it provides for replacement um, appliances in homes, things like that for low income individuals, and it would be a one time transfer. So it would not occur in the budget year, but in the out years that would continue. Thank you. Are you carrying on? Joe's not here? Apparently. The staff recommendations. Senator. Yes. Jesse McGuinn, Department of Finance, just to, to be on the record, is that we have significant concerns that this is a specific use fee that is charged. It was enabled by um, uh, Section 890 of Public Utilities Code, and while you know, we're not making a legal opinion. We have significant concerns that this cannot be transferred. It could be borrowed, but not transferred. Ms. Roberts? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I may, Ledge Council has opined on the particular nature of these funds. And as it was authorized as a tax, Ledge Council does consider this particular fund source and this particular fund to be general fund fungible. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. So, uh, Mr. 
Um, Randolph. Yeah, Senator Leno, um, Edward Randolph with the uh, Public Utilities Commission. Just to clarify one point that the LAO had made. Um, while the commission, um, while the utilities through commission order do spend approximately a billion dollars a year on energy efficiency today, um, we do not commingle the funds. And so money collected for electricity efficiency programs um, go to elect electricity. Funds collected for natural gas go to natural gas. So the consequence of sweeping this money into the budget would be the elimination of the natural gas efficiency programs for the short term. Um, for, um, for SoCal Gas, which is a gas only utility, that would be the entirety of their efficiency program. For San Diego Gas and Electric and PG&E, which provide go both gas and electric service, that would range from about 17 to I believe 22 percent of their efficiency programs. Okay, thanks for adding that. Uh, I think we have some concerns with, uh, we like the idea of where you're going, Ms. Roberts, uh, though we do have concerns with the uh, lack of access for the energy efficiency for the low-income folks. So rather than go with the 262 million transfer, reduce it to 162 million, which I think got a slight smile out of Ms. McClinock's face. I'm not quite sure. So uh, that is uh, Senator okay. Saulnier's motion. Yes, Ms. Uh, Senator Fuller. Our question would be, um, are these transfers being used to reduce the need for tax increases or to reduce other general fund reductions proposed by the governor? It seems we just would like to know for sure. I'm sorry. Can would, you repeat that? Are these transfers being used to reduce the need for tax increases or to reduce other general fund reductions proposed by the governor as your new motion is amended? This is a fund transfer of 162 million, okay. as opposed to 262 million, okay. and it's part of our entire package of 27 billion dollars okay. of resolutions. Then, then we would not be in. I understand. Favor. Okay, Mr. Yes, Senator Wright. I, I think we need to make clear here that these funds also carry an obligation, having written at least two of the programs myself. And I think if we do the language, Mr. Chair, that we've got to also do a trailer language that says that the obligation to provide the service is also taken away. Otherwise, you could end up with the company having to provide the service for which we've taken the money. It's a very good point. So we'll work on some trailer bill language. Okay. This, just a trailer bill that just the op, because because people actually call in for these services, whether it's weatherization or whatever it is, and if we're saying by taking the money that we're not going to provide the service, then you have to relieve the company from providing the service for which Point we well take Point Correct. well taken. Thank you, Ms. So uh, that passes with Democrats in support, with trailer bill language as described by Senator Wright, with Republicans' opposition. Uh, Ms. McQuinn, thank you. Ms. Randolph, Ms. Roberts. That concludes the CPUC. Page 16 is the Commission on State Mandates. Sixteen and seventeen. Good afternoon. Nona Martinez. Nona Martinez, Department of Finance. The governor's budget proposes a savings of $33 million through the suspension of six mandates related to elections and also proposes a savings of $63 million through the suspension of the Brown Act open meetings mandate. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Chairman, we'd uh, like to make the motion on staff's recommendation to approve the governor's proposal, if we could, on both the Commission on State Mandates and the Open Meetings Mandate. Oh, let's take them one at a time. Okay. So page 16 first. The motion by Senator Rubio is to approve the governor's proposal, and that will pass without objection. Thank you. As it pertains to the Brown Act. One second. Sure. Uh, Ms. Martinez? 
Governor's budget proposes a savings of $63 million through the suspension of the Brown Act. All right. Uh, I think there's some concern uh, among some on the committee with regard to that suspension, how it would actually impact the posting of agendas and what that does for the transparent actions of government. So uh, I'm going to suggest that we might have a motion where we would reduce the savings to $10 million that will move the item into conference so we can have further conversation. To fund it at 10 million, yes. Mr. Chairman, coming from local government and being a staunch supporter of the Brown Act, I could perhaps even recite the preamble to the Brown Act uh, to you. I wouldn't uh, restrain you. <laughs> well, we don't give up our sovereign right uh, to govern, but uh, I would move on the chairman's uh, amended recommendation. Thank you. Senator Fuller. I would like the LAO to uh, elaborate about a little bit about the history of this. Best practices, particularly. Okay. Um, Marianne O'Malley with the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, first off, this is not the entire Open Meeting Act. Um, all pieces of the Open Meeting Act step, um, stem from many decades ago. With this mandate, reimburses local governments for is the cost of preparing and posting an agenda 72 hours before the hearing and also disclosing what they're what they've done during um, an executive session um, this is a costly mandate something in the range of 20 million dollars a year and what you're seeing here is a series of prior years cost and under the Constitution you have to pay those prior year cost if you want to continue the mandate in the budget year what our office has previously recommended is that you recast the, these, this particular element of the Brown Act as being advisable best practices and require local governments to indicate whether or not they're following these advisable best practices or whether they are following some other procedures to ensure transparency and accountability at the local level. Um, and that was a, um, uh, it's been a longstanding LAO recommendation. Senator Fuller. Um, then um, we would be willing to go forward with your recommendation um, that we can and that we can discuss it more in conference committee. Thank you. Right. Um, it does seem like a very significant amount of money, as Ms. O'Malley has pointed out, just for the posting and disclosure of public meetings, $20 million a year. A question public policy question could be raised as to why is that the state's responsibility? But again, this is part of the tug of war we're having with local government and part of the realignment discussion we're going to be having very shortly. Uh, I know that there's been a bill, a constitutional amendment proposed by Senator Yee, which would put this requirement into the Constitution, which would then make it a requirement, a constitutionally uh, mandated requirement, as opposed to a legislative mandated requirement, in which case it would not be the state's cost, it would be the local obligation. So that deals with it in a more uh, direct way. So we can further that conversation. So the motion put forward by Senator Rubio will pass without objection. And that concludes state mandates. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Ms. O'Malley. Page 18 is the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Jack Kerwin, Acting Undersecretary for the Department of Veterans Affairs. The uh, governor's budget proposed a, a $9.9 .9 million decrease to the department, $2.3 million in state ops, and uh, 7.6 in local assistance, which zeroed the support to the county veteran service officers. Um, the department undertook an, an effort to um, look at our funding, rep reprioritize that funding, and that's the result that you see in the uh, finance letter. The finance letter itself uh, asks or recommends a cut of $5 million in local assistance in current year. That's, those are funds that were appropriated but not released yet. Uh, there's an additional $5.5 million 
uh, reduction in budget year. Uh, it recommends re restoring in budget year the $2.6 million to the CVSOs for net uh, $2.9 million increase in the reductions proposed in the governor's budget. Thank you, Mr. Kerwin. LAO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sean Martin, Legislative Analyst Office. We'd recommend approval of the February finance letter put forward by the administration. Very good. Uh, I think a somewhat delicate subject in that we all have great concern and, of course, significant appreciation for all of our veterans, especially those coming back from our current wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the stories are horrific in their description of traumatic brain injury, any number of other challenges that will face the veterans upon their return. I think that the effort and the thought behind the creation of the new Operation Welcome Home, which was, I think, really led by Governor Schwarzenegger, yes, was out of those stated concerns. The question, I think, for us is whether at a time we're taking so many drastic actions as anyone who's been paying attention to what we've been doing since Wednesday would have to acknowledge is, is this a state responsibility? Where is our federal government in terms of taking care of our veterans when they come back? So with the governor's proposal, uh, and if LAO could confirm this for us, that our veterans will still have services sustained it's just that this new program that Governor Schwarzenegger created, the Operation Welcome Home, and its $5 million, which was never expended, would not be expended, and the new program would not be implemented at this time. That is correct. However, the two point, I believe it's $2.6 million that's been in our, the, the budget since 2004 to provide support for the County Veterans Services offices would be maintained in the budget. So the state would be supporting the County Veterans Services offices at historic levels. Right. Senator LaMalfa. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so for question for finance then. You have no plans to expend the $5 million in the current year for Operation Welcome Home? John Fitzpatrick, Department of Finance, that's correct. The administration has determined that the provisional language in the item that contains those dollars allows finance that discretion. That's contained in language you feel that uh, you have that authority. It's, it's not a legislative mandate. By that's it. correct. May, may I offer then that uh, since this is really looked at as a, a five million in current year and, and what would have been five million in budget year, that we at the very least re reject the five million uh, cut in the budget year, as there are there are other savings, there's other revenue that Republicans are having heartburn with, but that we're going to go along with in these further to come, and that this be a priority that we keep as well. At the very least, the baseline of 2.3 million for veteran service offices be maintained. Since we're, we're scoring uh, $5 million worth of savings in the budget year that wasn't planned, as I see it. Mr. Kerwin. Uh, yes, sir. Just to uh, uh, clarify with the uh, Chair's comments a little earlier, the uh, primary reason for having Operation Welcome Home is not to, is to connect the veterans to the services provided by the uh, federal government, and, and by doing so, there's a significant e economic impact uh, to the state. The uh, federal government, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, spends $8 billion in the state in support of uh, veterans. Uh, $8 billion. $8 billion. So there's a significant impact. And the primary, it's been documented in many budget and policy committee hearings that the state of California has free, for a long time been uh, fallen very short of uh, our participation in, in veteran benefits. That was the whole purpose of Operation Welcome Home, is, is to make that connection between the veteran and the federal government so they can take advantage of those uh, services. Uh, as is often said, a, a, a veteran that doesn't know about their benefits is as good as a veteran denied their benefits. 
Thank you, Mr. Kerwood. Is, is there additional savings by connecting these to other services? Uh, there's, uh, there's a number of efforts to look at things uh, uh, like um, Medica there is Medi-Cal cost avoidance. There's our, that's our program is already in place. There's um, uh, agree agreements uh, with the Department of Healthcare Services to make better connections between uh, other um, uh, supportive services uh, and databases maintained by the federal government to make sure that we identify <laughs> veterans and transfer that information to the county veteran service officers so they can take people um, and get them veteran services as opposed to Medicare, Medi-Cal, uh, mental health, um, uh, any, one, any number of other services provided by the state. Thank you. Well, well they, the way I see it, it, it hasn't been scored in current year, the, the, the five million that has not been expended. I'm sorry, you want to repeat that? It has not been scored in current year as a savings. The five million hasn't been expended, correct? In the governor's plan. Finance, you want to address that? That's correct. The five million that's reflected in the recent finance letter was not part of the scoring for the governor's budget and is not documented in the agenda, at least in the totals in the middle column. Then it would be, um, we could score that savings this year. Why aren't we scoring the well, let me get it right. Uh, roll it into the budget year is the bottom line. We'll, we'll score the savings current year and roll it into the budget year since this year is not going to be expended. So just to clarify. Uh, so I would make a motion on that and uh, also to main the, the base, maintain the baseline of 2.3 that actually goes to the veteran service offices. These are, those are very critical as well. Mr. Senator, if I may, it's uh, 2.6 for the local offices. 2.6, and that's already sustained. That's correct. And, that's that, and that's being carried over in the governor's plan. Yes. Yeah, part right. of the so if I understand you correctly, Senator Lamalfo, what you're suggesting is that the $5 million, which has not been expended for the new program, which has not yet been implemented, rather than in the current year, it would, as it would on the natural, revert to the general fund. But the five million dollars for the budget year, you would like to see fund the implementation of a new program called Welcome uh, Operation Welcome Home. As as was promised, yes, the, the Welcome Home is a. Uh, pardon, pardon. It was supposed to have been done last year. The five million was being counted upon, so we're actually uh, rolling it into the new budget year, which. Uh, is already seen as a $5 million savings in current year. So I, I don't think that's unreasonable. I understand. Mr. Kerwin, you look like you have a comment? No, sir. I just want to make sure we got the numbers right. The $5 million uh, is local assistance. The 2.6 that the senator is talking about is local assistance as well. Very good. Okay. So committee members, uh, just clarify. <laughs> I just have a question, Mr. Chair. Senator Wolk. So the Operation Welcome Home then never began? Never began. Uh, operation, uh, there's two two portions of it. Uh, there's a state operations portion of it, which uh, began last, uh, uh, actually it began last February, right. uh, was funded $2.3 million in the current year. We we do have uh, state staff that are uh, implementing that. Uh, the major portion of that happens as uh, what we call regional collaborative coordinators. Mm -hmm. There's nine uh, state staff that uh, try to, that pull together all the various services, whether they're uh, federal, state, local, uh, non-governmental operations, faith-based, uh, they pull those together and make that connection between the vet and the um, yes. and those I, services. I do know what the program is. I, we had a um, uh, Solano County event for veterans, and in fact, that was one of, uh, last spring, and that was one of the programs we talked about, and it was, Operating. Yes, so that, that program, the state operations program is uh, in, a, in effect uh, as we speak and the two, uh, a cut of 2.3 in state ops would, uh, uh, would result in layoffs to those, to those folks. That would stop. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Now I'm even confused a bit here. Um, I see these as two separate issues. On the one hand, we have funding for the Veteran Services Office, which I think is paramount, and I want to thank the Department of Finance for bringing your February letter 
to say that we are going to fund it, keep the lights on to ensure that we can link our veterans coming back. Having a district with the military installations is extremely important um, for the district that I have the honor of representing. So that's one issue. Yes, sir. The second is the Welcome Home program. That Was that ramped up and is that program being implemented today on the streets in the state of California? Uh, um, there's, there's some confusion results in the, in the uh, fact that Operation Welcome Home moniker covered both state operations and, and the CVSO operations. Um, I, you know, I do, you know, from discussions with CVSOs, I know uh, that they ramped up because they saw the appropriation in the Budget Act. They ramped up their activities already this year to some extent. Some counties were a little dubious of the state and their ability to provide that funding and may not have done so. But I do know there are counties that have actually hired people already in anticipation of uh, the full $7.6 million this year. And so did the federal government provide any funding for the program, or is this something that was solely going to be funded by uh, state the, dollars? This, the uh, only funding that the federal government provides relates to the in, uh, individual benefit provided to the veteran. So a veteran files uh, a claim uh, with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and they get paid compensation uh, for service-connected disabilities. That's where the economic benefit but what, you know, Operation Welcome Home is, is strictly a, a state-funded uh, uh, program with, of course, the exception of the counties provide significant amount of uh, funding to their CVSOs. Thank you, Mr. Crew. And I'd like to ask the LEO, could you provide some clarification for us? Was this not one-time federal funding that we're talking about? For Operation Welcome Home, it was, it was one time, I believe, general fund that was provided to the, the CVSOs the $5 billion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I can cl uh, uh, clarify. Excuse me, just okay. for a second, Mr. Kerwin. I'm going to go back to finance. Operation w Welcome Home was um, added to existing baseline funding levels in the last Budget Act and was intended to be ongoing. And maybe as a possible um, point of clarification with respect to the confusion, the state oper there was $2.3 million of state operation funding in, in the budget for Operation Welcome Home activities, an additional $5 million of local assistance, which due to the provisional language in the budget became a discretionary uh, uh, piece of funding hmm. for the administration. Uh, both pots were uh, built in as ongoing components. So the project started in February of 2010. That's correct. The department can speak to the details of efforts that were underway before uh, the last fiscal year began. Was but there, it's a multi-departmental effort that included. Was there money in the budget at the time, state funding in the budget at the time of February 2010 when the program began? If I may speak to that, Mr. Chair, um, what, what happened in February of 2010, um, as finance has indicated, this was a multi-departmental uh, effort. What I've been speaking to is the, strictly the Veterans Affairs portion of the budget. What happened in February of 2010 was the uh, uh, Employment Development Department's effort. They had federal dollars uh, from the Department of Labor to establish what was called the CalVet Core EDD. That was really the initial portion of the ramp up for the entire operation. And home. that was one time federal money? Uh, that was one time federal money, yes. That sir. was about $5 million? Uh, at, at that one was about uh, $20 million, as I recall. It funded about a um, 250 limited term uh, uh, state employees throughout the, throughout the state. And that money came to an end at the end of the last calendar year. That, uh, that money, the, they, the federal government allowed uh, EDD a little more latitude in, in terms of what fiscal year that was uh, expended in. Um, uh, it, it, I believe it, the final amount will be running out this spring. They've, they've managed to man stretch that, that okay. money significantly. So, <clears throat> committee members, uh, slightly murky territory here. I think we're all concerned. Uh, about the uh, well-being of our veterans, but I think the policy question before us relative to Senator LaMalfa's motion, which is to have $5 million of general fund money 
continue this Operation Welcome Home, a new program at a time when we're cutting so many existing programs. The veterans will continue to be served by the 2.6 million, as the LAO has already told us, which is ongoing money for services for our veterans. The question is whether we fund this new program to the tune of $5 million. Could Senator Hancock. Um, just to clarify again, aren't veterans also eligible for some of the services we just cut? In-home supportive services, if they're in wheelchairs, or uh, clinical services? <laughs> Senator Rubio. Mr. Chairman, perhaps we could strike a meeting here, trying to find middle ground. Rather than the full five million, what I think for many of the veteran services offices who did ramp up this last fiscal year in the middle of this fiscal year, if rather than trying to take the promised money to them to pay for that ramping up and apply it to their operations next fiscal year, if rather than the five million we do two and a half to pay for that ramping up and then provide for 2.6 that's in the uh, February finance paper uh, letter moving forward. I think then the policy question before this legislative body is moving forward, do we want to fund a new program going into future years? I, I get where you're going with this. I think that splitting it in half is somewhat arbitrary in that we don't know exactly what the costs you're trying to cover are. So just so we can get some greater clarity on all of this, I'm going to just put this over to a little later in the meeting and we'll get some more information. We'll come back to it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I? May I? Senator LaMalfa. Okay. I, I thank you. I appreciate the um, interaction here with the different members on at least taking a careful look at this. Um, I would be a little bothered by the idea that this is being scored as a new program, it has been around a year, and if there, if there isn't any new legislation proposed amongst both houses this year that is not a new program, then I'll eat my hat, which is still in my truck, but um, I, that, that bit of language kind of bothers me a little bit, but uh, I, I think this has been seen as a pretty important way to go as we have returning veterans in an influx from overseas during this time in the wrap up. Now, uh, my understanding this is going to be a $5 million ongoing, and then during this budget year, a loophole was found by probably both administrations to not not spend this. So I'll just leave the comments to that, but uh, I, I appreciate the bill that we can uh, revisit this. Thank you, and I appreciate your graciousness in putting your motion on hold as we return to it uh, later this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Kurt. When you have one other issue before us, and that's on page 19. Uh, th thank you, sir. These, this item uh, continues the uh, ramp up and, and opening. Uh, the ramp up is continuing on the Greater Los Angeles Ventura County uh, uh, Veterans Home, primarily in the West LA campus. It also uh, starts the uh, ramp up uh, with the uh, veterans homes in Fresno and Redding. Uh, Redding will be opening, uh, finished construction in January of 12, and uh, Redding, uh, I'm sorry, Fresno will finish uh, later in the spring of 2012. There is no one in these homes currently. Uh, there's no one in the Fresno and Reading homes. They're still under construction. Right. LAO. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sean Martin with the Ledge Analyst Office. We haven't raised any issues with the budget chain proposals. However, we note there's nobody in these homes at these points. Um, there is, you know, the potential of slowing down the ramp up of the homes, but we believe that would be contingent upon federal approval if you were to, if you were to want to go in that direction. And given the uh, uncertainty of what exactly our caseload will be, would there be sense in uh, revisiting this in the spring? I think so. Yeah. All right. On we, we and we come back with updated, in, you know, recommendations in the spring. Right, Senator Rubio. Given the case of Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move on staff's recommendation, which is contingent upon federal approval. To delay the opening. To the delay the opening of Reading Fresno Veteran Homes of California until 2012-13. Very good. So that is the motion, and that is without objection. Thank you, Mr. Kerwin. Take it up. 
So, colleagues, uh, we're going to address an issue that is uh, not in our agenda. This is regarding the uh, scoring by the Senate budget of an additional $75 million of general fund reduction. This is related to IT and other operational savings in control section 3.91. And Senator Rubio is going to address some of the specifics. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During sub four, we uh, took this item up, and I want to thank staff for bringing it forward. As we know now that uh, our state operations efficiencies numbers are going to include $75 million more in savings because when you look at the 1112 Budget Act, it did not include IT related savings. Rather, the CS 3.91 states that 363 million or 200 million general fund savings will be a result of departmental consolidation, operational efficiencies, and the cost reduction measures, such as reduced contracts. What we'd like to do is add the information technology savings as well, which results in that difference. So you have a motion? And as such, I'd like to move on it. All right. Senator Fuller. Okay, so on this issue, why are we not, have we not collected the budgeted amounts? And so we're not completely convinced that the money is real, so we'd like to have a little more information about that. Here's someone to finance who can address that. Richard Gillahan, Department of Finance. If you could repeat the question, I couldn't hear it back there. Okay. Sure. Uh, why have we not collected the budgeted amount to date? With respect to the from IT the savings? From the past years, from the IT savings, yes. Um, th there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, one of them is a lot of the um, consolidation activities of the CIO's office are sort of longer-term strategies that haven't produced the short-term savings that were anticipated at that point in time, but we still see the long-term value in those. Um, others have to do with the effect of um, numerous unallocated reductions across departments that there's probably not that much general fund, discretionary general fund being spent on IT. So um, we submitted a letter to JLBC on the 9-10 savings numbers, and we're working on the 10-11 savings numbers now. So what would convince me that this number was going to be a solid number? Uh, that number is not our proposal, so I can't speak to that. Okay, so would, we, would you estimate that you'd be able to capture this amount? Uh, we would be concerned with our ability to be able to reach that savings in light of the 200 million we've already put in the governor's budget. Okay. Mr. Bland, can you help answer Senator Fuller's question? I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, the, Essentially, uh, as yeah, to, to step back, um, the, the governor's reorganization plan, the prior administration, um, did talk about efficiencies, and uh, I think for two years in a row, there was a the legislature had a control section essentially uh, booking either 100 or even 140 million. I thought one year in potential savings from IT, um, as as Mr. Gillahan said. Um, not all those savings were realized. I think it's a question of. Um, essentially how you want to sort of uh, structure your control section. If you structure it sort of firmer, take the money out of the budgets and then give finance some authority to put some of it back rather than essentially what, what the control section did is it just sort of assumed it would happen and then it didn't materialize. I think um, although uh, it, it's possible we could get the 75 million, it's something our office is looking into. Um, it, 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 it is a question of, with all of the other kinds of control section reductions, it, 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 it will be tricky. It, well, it puts pressure on state operations. Let me just let me just put it that way. I think you could write you could write a control section that would do the job, and you could do that. Right? Is that seventy five million dollars not the LAO's figure? The seventy five million dollars was in a letter that was sent that I believe your office has made public. That's yes. what I thought. Yes. All right. So again, I hope that the $75 million reduction, Senator Fuller, along with the budget bill language that will accompany it would ensure that the budgets are taken down reflective of the achieved I, IT savings. I think that one key point, Jason Sisney of the LAO, would be that this would be leading 
to uh, likely IT service reductions. And by putting it in this sort of a section, uh, the legislature might not have control of what exactly those reductions would be. And as Mr. Bland pointed out, this would be putting pressure on state operations, especially in the IT area. So while, while you do have this option, uh, if you take the, the sort of really broad approach, putting it in a control section, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get, uh, as well as having the just the questions about whether the savings are achievable. So I'm not completely clear on why you're talking about the reorganization when the intent was to create efficiencies and that you said that you thought that there was a value long term in creating those efficiencies and I, we're very interested in creating those efficiencies and, and getting the savings but but it's very difficult to assert that that's a, that that's a real scored savings. I, th I think it's it's a uh, there, there may be, there may be a little bit of a disagreement between the Department of Finance and the original uh, governor's reorganization plan and the figures put out. The uh, the amounts were consistent with numbers that the I believe the then the OCIO now the California Technology Agency uh, did release. Uh, but again, it I think the difficulty is it's it's these kind of control sections are on top of other kinds of um, employment and other kinds of control sections seeking savings. And you, you, uh, to, to use maybe a bad analogy, you can sort of only squeeze the state operations lemon so many times. Um, but um, conceptually, we think there is room, you know, if you make this one work, you may, you may cause a problem somewhere else. But we think there is a way to operationalize this savings. It would be with a different kind of control section. I think uh, what Mr. Sisney was getting at was that the way, the way we've done it before is we've just sort of taken it out on the bottom line and let finance operationalize it. Um, the way we thought you might be able to get this specific 75 is we would identify specific departmental budgets. We would take the money out of each of those. Uh, perhaps more than the 75 million, maybe 100 million, and then give finance the authority, maybe 25 million, to sort of put back at the places where it was most needed. That was how we were thinking it would be operationalized. Um, standalone, we think it's a workable option, but you have to think of it in the context of all the other things you're doing with state operations. Very good. So the uh, motion is and the suggestion is that we score the $75 million. We work over the spring months with the LAO and with finance to develop the budget bill language to make sure it's enacted. Mr. Chair, for the record, we are opposed to this action. Very good. All right. So we'll I think we are willing to support on the, the better heck of trying to get the savings and then all of us being very cognizant that if it doesn't materialize, we'll have to come back and address it. Right. And better effort, so we support. We'll have the months of April, May before we cast our votes on the budget in June. So that motion of Senator Rubio's passes without objection. Good job, Chris. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Jim. Moving on to page 20, the Franchise Tax Board's non-budget act item of refundable child and dependent care expense credit. Good afternoon, Jay Chamberlain, uh, Department of Finance. This this is not our proposal. So, you know, have no position on it. We have not reviewed this proposal. So the uh, recommendation here is to approve placeholder trailer bill language, and this would eliminate just the refundable nature of this tax credit. Uh, there would be no changes to the core tax credit program. And the reason for this is to uh, fund the preservation of the stage three child care at a level above the governor's budget. The general fund savings would be achieved by reducing general fund and shifting the TANF to fund stage three. Motion on that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and um, Senator Emerson. Well, we would like to um, share some of this uh, funding and some other uh, programs, but. Um, Not this. <laughs> like the, the Welcome Home Program? <laughs> then maybe some uh, Williamson, but uh, 
So we're just laying off. Yeah. We'll just lay off. All right. So then this will pass with Democrats in support and Republicans abstaining. Page 21. <laughs> is in fact the Williamson Act open space subventions. Chris Hill, Department of Finance. The administration proposes to eliminate the current year $10 million appropriation for Williamson Act subventions that was authorized by Senate Bill 863 from the previous session. And we also propose to eliminate some statutory changes that were made to the Williamson Act program by that legislation. Um, may I ask a question on that? Of course, Senator LaMalfa. Thank you. Uh, what did uh, what did the uh, what was the elimination you were talking about of uh, an SB 863? Senate Bill 863 also made some statutory changes to the program wherein county assessors had the ability to, if they participate in Williamson Act and receive subventions, and those subvention amounts don't offset a certain amount of their lost property tax revenue, they can upwardly assess the value of the land by a certain amount, and then it also create, if that doesn't result in additional revenues, and I believe what it was is that the term of the contract can then be adjusted downward. Thank you. Again, the, for uh, this is a, a bit of a troubling item here, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this this item troubles me a little bit too, as a uh, couple couple factors here that uh, you know in our subcommittee we pass this unanimously to uh, to move this along with a twenty million dollar subvention and. Now, and, and traditionally, until the last couple of years, it's been a, a $40 million item. And so $20 million is still a 50% reduction. And we're talking about also that these are 10 and 20 year contracts that are in place with the county and the, the property owners. And the extreme importance to some counties of this funding as well. So I, I think that uh, we had a situation where a $20 million one was a, was a good compromise. And so let me, I know the direction that I think the committee wants to go. Will this something that, will this item be revisited in the conference committee a little later? Do we know what's going on? Uh, my information is is the assembly did support the governor's proposal. In a full budget committee? Yes. So by our also approving the governor's proposal to eliminate the funding, this will not go to conference. I, I think it's um, I think it's a mistake, but uh, I I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm intending to vote no on this measure. Okay, Senator Wolk. I'd like to, if I could just speak for a moment, very briefly to um, Take the time. importance. Pardon. Take your time. To the importance of the Williamson Act to many of us who are sitting up here and many um, uh, members of the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, this has been an ongoing struggle, as, Doug, as Senator LaMalfa knows from his experience in the Assembly um, through the last governor, and um, it's been, um, over the last couple of years, there have been real efforts to involve the counties in a discussion of ag preservation and how we're going to move forward beyond the Williamson Act. Not that the Williamson Act hasn't been successful, it has, but part of the problem with funding it continuously has been that not everybody agrees with that, including administration folks and, and um, lots of folks. So it's incumbent on us if we care about ag conservation, and I do, and I know you do, and many others do here, even if they don't have a lot of ag land in their district, that we have to figure out a way to move this discussion with the counties to a way of, pre of, of approaching ag conservation, finding other mechanisms to do it, other funding sources to do it, uh, that will be more effective in the long run than this patchwork of Williamson Act, which, which doesn't get funded to the level that it should and hasn't for the last few years. So I think that sometimes 
uh, crisis begets opportunity, and um, that was true last year, and now we're in even worse situation. So I would support the motion with regret. So, uh, Senator LaBeouf, I appreciate your sensitivity to this issue, as I do Senator Wilkes, uh, and uh, this is a hardship for my county, too. Uh, the proposal uh, is a difficult one. At the same time, we've been cutting 1.3 billion from CalWORKs. We're cutting 151 million from Adult Day Healthcare Services. The list is long. It's where we are right now. Senator Emerson. Well, we've identified some other savings and you've chosen not to allow us to protect this program, so uh, Republicans are just gonna stay off of this. Thank you, Senator Emerson. Sergeants, can you confirm for us if there are other budget committee members in the building or have members taken off for the weekend? We're trying to see what our universe of votes might be. And I would ask any budget committee member who is in the building to please come to the committee room. We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. I thank everyone for bearing with us. We're going to take a 10-minute recess. Find out who's here, who's not.